Okay, uh, were there some questions about the homework today? I think some people were just wondering about the wording of the exercise, whether you should draw the logic diagram or not or something, but just go with what the book says to do. No questions about the homework? I have a question. Oh, wait, actually I have homework back for you. Uh, did you say you had a question? Yes. Yeah, I did, yeah. Um, when you're making the design table, or the, I don't really know what to call it, the XI table, whatever, when you yeah, it's the design the, the diagram the, to the table. The, yeah, fig, figure 11.33 is the design table. And it, it has the, XI, the information from the excitation table in, in it. Okay, so do you have to put it in that order? Like on the first four columns? Well, it helps whenever you transfer the information to your Carnot maps. The reason it's done in the order, in figure 11.33, under initial state, A at time T, B at time T, mm -hmm. the reason it's done in order 00011110 is so that it will be in that order so that it will be in that order under the flip-flop input conditions on the right side of the table. Uh -huh. because, mm -hmm. because if it's in this order, then we can just go column to column. Mm -hmm. We can just take a column in this table and put it in a column of the Carnot map without having to mentally yeah. flip the order, which would possibly cause a mistake. So I really prefer, it's to your advantage to do it this way. Because otherwise, when you transfer the, the data when you transfer the conditions, mm -hmm. the flip-flop input conditions to your Carnot maps, it's re trust me, it's really easy. I, for, it's really easy to make a mistake because you have to say, oh, this is 0001101. Oh, that means, but, but in the Carnot map, it's 0001110. Mm -hmm. Do you see why? It's to match. It's so that, it's so that when you transfer, it, you're looking ahead. You're anticipating so that when you transfer the data from here to the Carnot map, mm -hmm. it's the same order, and you won't have you won't have to flip it. Because okay. in like, that's what we had in homework, you mm -hmm. have A, B, and C is the state, and just X is the input. Well, but then here's okay. That's a good question. So for me, it didn't make sense. Well, this, no, no. But look, how are you going to do your Carnot map? Yeah, A, B, C, X. Yeah, okay. yeah. So what I'm saying is, look. If, you, if your Carnot map is going to be A, B, and then you're going to have C, X here, mm -hmm. this will be 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, and this will be 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. So you should do it with the A, B being 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, and then the C, X being 0, 0, a block of 0, 0, and a block of 0, 1, and a block of 1, 1, and a block of 1, 0. Okay. Just, that's just looking ahead. Just, it's just a little... Oh, sure, you can leave it that way, but be very careful. Yeah. By the way, you know, when I give you these kinds of problems on the, on the exam, you know on the next exam you're going to have a design problem and an analysis problem. I will set up the table with those that way. Because it's, it would be horrible for me to have to grade all these papers and have some people do them in one order and some people do them in another. And not only that, for the analysis problem, I noticed that some people didn't label your states. Like if we look at figure 11.32, it's going clockwise. It's 00101101. Some people change the order there and then I have... So I'll even give you the state the states in the order that I want it so that I can just so that I can grade it e more easily. Does everybody? These are all good questions. More questions? But yeah, you can leave. If you didn't do it that order, that's fine. But you got to be careful. Did you notice that if because you didn't do it that order, that when you put it here, you had to put it here and then here, and then you had to put it down here, down here, and then down here, and that wasn't the same order that was, as it was on the table. So were you careful? Good. Oh yeah, and then you sort of like got the pattern down. But still, you have to get the pattern, you know. So. 
That, yeah, but it's not necessary. In fact, you know, basically, I don't, you know, that, that design table is intermediate. I'm, I'm just interested in the final result, you know. I assume that if the Carnot maps are, are laid out correctly in the, you know. So, anyway. These are all good questions. Okay, any more questions before we go on? We've got spring break coming up next week. That's pretty cool. But you are also going to have a homework assignment for Monday when you get back. <laughs> you don't like that? <laughs> a lot of sourpuss faces out there I see. <laughs> Okay, but that's the way it is. All right, are you ready to go? You ready to, I, I don't mean leave, I mean, are we ready to continue? <laughs> okay, all right, so what we're going to do now is, now that we have done sequential analysis and sequential design, now what we're going to do is, as, as we did with the combinational material, we're now going to look at some practical devices about how to put these things together to form the building blocks of a computer, of a CPU, of a computer system. And the first type of device that we're going to look at is called, is the register. So check this out. What is a register? What's an example of a register in the, now we're going to get, we're, we're going to get, start talking about PEP-8, the PEP-8 ar register? architecture. Well, there, the index register is an example of one of the registers, and where is the index register actually? In the CPU. It's in the CPU. Another example is an accumulator. And I don't know if you remember this, but the registers in the CPU of, uh, of PEP-8, they are all, they are two bytes, 16 bits, right? Well, look. What can you do with a register in the CPU? You can execute the load instruction. So if you load the accumulator, where does information come from? Um, Remember the load accumulator instruction in the instruction set? Yeah, the load accumulator comes from whatever comes after the instruction. So it's like whatever is being read in. Yeah, and if it's direct addressing, for example, which was the first one, that, one of the first addressing modes we learned. It's exactly what it is. Good, good. Uh, that's immediate. That's that immediate. would be immediate. Direct, direct immediate ad address is, it is. It's the address and memory of where it is. Okay? But regardless of where it comes from, that two-byte value goes into the accumulator. Right? And then what's the one that goes the other way? Instead of going into the accumulator, it goes out of the accumulator. That's the what? Not load, but what? Store. That's store. So what we have to be able to do with these registers is we have to be able to load them and store them. Load to them and store. Are you with me? Okay. So here it is, you guys. It's, it's all it is, is our old D flip-flop. It's just an array of them. A D flip-flops just next to each other. That's all it is. So it's constructed as an array of D flip-flops with a load line that connects to each CK input. And what this means is that data is clocked into the register in parallel. Are you with me? So, now what's abstraction? Hiding detail. Hiding detail. And so in figure 11.36, in part A, we have the abstract representation of a register. And what we have is, so th this register has, it has this fat arrow. Remember we used the fat arrows in the, um, well, when, when in data flow into the, what? Uh, ALU. what? In the ALU, okay? So here's, we have a fat arrow, so that represents several lines coming in, and in this particular orientation, they're coming in to the top. And then we have a bunch of uh, a pipe of data going out. And then we have a control line that we are labeling load coming in. And so if we're just looking at figure 11.36a, the way it works is we assume that if we want to load something into the register, we set up the information on the data in lines. 
and then when those data inlines are once those data inlines are set, then the then we then we um, pulse load. So load goes up and down, right? And then after that, after we do that, the data that was in here now is in the D registers because actually you remember what was the characteristic of a D register? Whatever is in the queue. Sorry, what, yes, delay or data, and whatever is whatever's in, that goes in. I mean, whatever the input is, the state is that input after the clock pulse. Remember that with the D flip flops, okay? And so, and 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 so in part A, you cannot really tell how many lines are coming in parallel in the data in, or how many lines are coming out. So it depends on how wide the register is. And um, in PEP8, the registers are going to be, they're actually going to be 8 bits wide because our data paths are going to be 8 bits. So, so an accumulator would have to be two of these next to each other. But uh, just to keep the, the uh, figure simple without too many wires all over the place, part B shows an implementation of a register for just, of a 4-bit register. But you can see if it were 8, there would just be 8 of them, and 16, there'd be 16 of them, right? 32, 64, whatever. And so, in part B, what we see is this pipe that says data in coming in is actually four lines, and each line is going to the D input of a separate flip-flop. And then the data out is just, is simply the what? The Q. And we don't care about the Q bar. We just ignore it. And furthermore, what is the load control line doing? It's going into what? Each one of the clock impulse simultaneously. So do you see that because that is happening simultaneously, that's, it's parallel. It's not having to feed it in from one end. It's not having to shift it in. It's, it's going in parallel all at once. Because that clock, because that load, what is our external load control line going into the register is actually fanning out and going into each one of those clocks, the clock input of each flip-flop individually. Is, there, is, that, is, all, is this all easy to understand? Mm -hmm. Cool. Huh? All right. So that's basically how the register inside of the CPU is built. Now, between, uh, but w w now what we're going to do is we want to see how memory is organized in a computer. Now, do you remember the four parts of the computer? Bus. The, well, the bus is what connects the four parts. The yeah, there's, there's a CPU, there's a main memory, there's input device, there's output device. They're all connected with the bus. Okay, so and what is the bus? The bus is a group of wires connecting two subsystems. Now, here comes some real, real world practical uh, difficulties. And let's think about how, because you've done some experimenting in the lab, let's think about how you get information to go from, remember we did some, we, we, we hooked up some flip-flops in the lab. How did we get, anytime we have, we hook up a gate in a lab, we always have to have the input of one gate always has to come from what? The input from one gate or one device always has to come from what? Switches. Well, it could come from a switch or it could come from the output of another device, right? Mm -hmm. Is everybody with me on this? Or power or, or power or ground through a switch. Yes, it could be permanently, it could have a switch that could, we could set it, the input one way or the other, or it could be permanently connected to power or ground. Is everybody clear on that? Okay. Now, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Have you ever in the lab, it might be too soon for you to have done this yet, but has, have you guys ever in the lab actually accidentally connected the outputs of two gates together? Has anybody ever made that mistake yet? Oh, you guys are pretty good. What would happen if you did that? See, what, what would happen if you had a, what would happen if you had like a NAND gate like this, and you had another NAND gate like this, 
and you actually, you sort of accidentally did this. Wouldn't it kind of just, oh no. It this, is the this is the big question. It, could, it wouldn't be predictable. Yeah. What, what you mean by that is not like you end those together. You, you're just touching the wires? Exactly. You're touching the wires. Yes. There's no OR gate here. I was going to assume that it would act as an OR gate, but then why would we have OR gates? Oh, you, you assume that it would act as an OR gate, but then why would we have OR gates? That's a really good point. Actually, there is, yeah. You see, everybody, you understand what the problem is. The problem is, if the output of this is 1 and the output of this is 1, well, this would be 1 because there's no conflict. Right. Or if this is 0 and this is 0, this would be 0 because there's no conflict. The problem is, what would happen if one of these is 1 and one of these is 0? Because this is an output of 1 and this is an output of 0. Well, it's actually kind of interesting. There are some gate te fabrication technologies for gates where if you did this, it would actually work. And it would actually work as an OR. And but that technology is we don't, we're not going to go down. We're not going. We are not going to go down that road. That's called wired OR. Well, it depends on the technology of the gates, and you do, you wouldn't need an OR gate in that case. You would just connect these together, and it would act as. And you see you see why it's called wired OR. Because it acts, if you wire these together, it acts like an OR. And you don't actually need an OR gate. So if, this, if one of these is 1 and the other one is 0, this will be 1. And that depends on the NAND gates? No, that depends on the technology behind the gates. The NAND the, gates or different gates? The NAND gate. Well, all the gates. All the gates in a family are use, use the same technology in order for them to all work together. Okay. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. But that's, we're, we're not going to go... That, that's a curiosity. I'm just saying that some technologies, in some technologies, this would actually work, but that's a, we're not going to go that, that, that's not, we're not going to do that. It's a curiosity for us. It's not normal. So, so this is a problem. Are you with me? Even though there exists this wired order technology, this is a problem. The problem is, if you have a 1 coming out of here and a 0 coming out of here, this is undefined. Are you with me? Does everybody see that? understand that problem. Okay, so that's the problem. Now, where does this problem crop up? What we have in a computer system is we have the CPU on one hand and we have memory on the other hand, right? So suppose the CPU is over here and the memory is over here and we want information to go from the CPU, from the CPU to memory. All right. In order for it to go from the CPU to memory, what's the output of the CPU has to be the what? The output of a gate and the input of memory has to be the what? The input, the input of a gate. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, if we want information to go from memory to the CPU, then what has to happen? It has to be the output. The the output of the memory, of, it has to be on the wire, right. the bus is a wire, and that has to go to the what? The to the input of a, of a CPU. What that means is that if we, you know, in the absence of anything that we have yet to consider, those, we would need what? Separate we would need wires. separate wires on the bus. Is everybody with me? We would need a send wire. We, we, we would need, you know, we, we would need a, a a send wire from the from the memory to the CPU and a receive wire from the memory to the CPU, and and they'd have to be duplicated. And you know, suppose you have like a 64 bit wide bus, wires. it'd be 128 wires instead of 64. Now, do you see how that? You see what the problem is? But that's what happens with a that, that's what happens with a unit with a unidirectional bus. Data can only flow in one direction because of this this gate problem. So it would be a huge advantage to be able to have our wires be what not unidirectional but what bi but bidirectional. But if we're going to have them be bidirectional, what problem do we have to solve? We have to solve this problem of you can't connect two outputs together. Do you see what I mean? 
Is everybody with me on this? So now, the, but it, it is such an important, it would save so much that it's going to be worth our while to do that, to solve this problem. And so that's what we're going to do. So how, so what are the characteristics of a, bi, of a bidirectional bus? The, the characteristics of a bidirectional bus is, first of all, it only requires half the number of wires between two subsystems. That's the big savings. But that big savings comes at a cost. Everything in life is a trade-off, right? You can have high luxury, but low gas mileage. <laughs> you know, so we can have fewer wires, but it's going to cost us something. The problem is you cannot connect the inputs of two gates. Sorry, you can connect the inputs of two gates, but you cannot connect the outputs of two gates. And so the solution to this problem is with a new device that we're going to have to learn about. It's called the tri-state buffer. Okay? And we've never talked about tri-state buffers before, but here we go. The tri-state buffer is going to solve this problem. Now, the next slide, this figure 11.37, is a picture of the, of the scenario of what, of what we have to... You know, a scenario of data flow in between two subsystems, bidirectional. In other words, we use the same wire, whether it's going from one to the other or to the other from the one, all right? And so you can imagine that subsystem A is like the CPU and subsystem B is like the memory, and then the wire between them is like a bus, mm -hmm. the bus. Now, there are four, and, and what we're talking about here is just one of the 32 wires or one of the 64 wires, okay, but the rest are alike. And so basically there are four different gates that are involved in the process, okay? We want to have memory, we have, want to have data go to and from subsystem A and to and from subsystem B. So in subsystem A, gate one represents data going which way into which way, with respect, yeah, that's going into subsystem A. And then gate 2 represents the output from subsystem A. But look, it's going, where are, what are they connected to? They're connected to the same what? To the same, but, to the same wire, the, literally the same wire. And then subsystem B, gate 3, is, is, um, is input into subsystem B, and gate 4 is output from some subsystem B, but here again, on the same wire. Now tell me, you guys, which ones do we have to coordinate? 2 and 4. We have to, yeah, uh, well, I mean, if we're going to go, tell me just descriptively, if we want to send something from subsystem B to subsystem A, what do we have to shut down? The if, input to three and the output of two, or just the output of two? Yeah, that's a good question. The input, the question, so, so what do we have, I, I said it, what do we have to shut down? We want it to go from B to A, so we know it has to come out of four. And into one. And into one. Okay. So somehow we have to isolate, hmm? Do we have to shut down both two and three? I don't know if you have to shut down three. Unless, but the, I think you do because if the input to three changed the output to four, I mean there'd be a certain number of gate delays. Oh, that that's oh, that's a really good. These are really good questions. This is a combina combinational. Okay, no, yeah, yeah. The answer is no. It's not combinational. It's sequential. I mean these because these subsystems are going to like there might be if this is the CPU, this might go to the registers in the CPU. This might go to the to the memory. You know, you see what I'm saying? So, so uh, what did you, you say? You need to block three because there, there, I imagine there'd be some sort of clock pulse or something that would prevent it from changing. That's, exa that's exactly right. Did you guys hear what he said? What, what, we're, saying, what, what, what we're saying is that it's really not necessary to, to isolate three. If we're sending information from subsystem B to subsystem A from gate four into gate one, the important thing is that we shut down the output of gate two, because that's what would cause the conflict. Are you with me? And even if the input to gate three, we can just choose to ignore 
what the output of gate 3 is into subsystem B whenever we are sending information from B to A. Now, is everybody clear on that? So are we, this is really important conceptual stuff that we're doing here. All right. And by the same token, what do we have to do? If we want information to go from subsystem A to subsystem B, we have to be able to do what? Shut down, Shut down, four. Shut down four. So really the only gates that we're looking at shutting down here are two and four. Mm -hmm. But we have to coordinate it. You know, we have to coordinate them. So if we're going to have information go from B to A, we've got to shut off 2. And if we're going to have information go from A to B, we have to shut off gate 4. Yeah? Now, what do we mean by shut off? You know? Yeah. It's not like, it's not just disable. Yeah, and that's a, that's a really good point. It's not just disable. Because if it were just disable, how do, we, how do our enable lines work for our gates when we do enable? What, what does it do? If enable is zero, what does that happen? What makes it, it, makes it, it makes the output zero. But just making the output of two zero, it could, if the output of four is one, that's a conflict. Unless it's a wired or. Which it's not going to be. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry I brought it up. <laughs> but is there, are you with me? So it's not just disabling like we, it's not just doing our old enable, disable with AND gates. We can't do that. Instead, what we need is we need a device that is equivalent to literally disconnecting to from the wire. In other words, as if, as if it could actually lift it off and not be touching it. Well, now lifting it off and not touching it, that's called a high impedance. You guys know your, do you know circuits? Impedance is like resistance. And so if you, yeah, it's like putting a huge resistor in, in, in between there. So big that the signal, it's, it's as if it's disconnected so that it won't conflict. So whatever its value is coming out, it won't conflict. All right. So now what happens, the reason this, the reason this is called a tri-state device, here's what a tri-state device looks like. It... Oh, not, sorry, without the inverter. A tri-state device looks like this. Looks like this. And this is in, and this is out. And so it's like this in going to this out. But then also there is the control. Yeah, so, yeah, so this is the E. I think we're going to call that, yeah. And so this is E. But now this is... This is a tri-state device, so it's kind, it's, it's, it's kind of like an AND, but if this is enabled, then what's it like? This goes through, but then if it's not enabled, then what's it like? It's like, it's like this is broken. You know, it's as if there's a gap here and it's physically disconnected. It's electrically dis it's not physically disconnected, it's electrically disconnected. Are you with me? So here's the truth table for it. Figure um, 11.38 has, so now it's three. Well, let's go, well this, one's, this one is A, and this one is E, and this is the output X. Okay? And if you look at figure 11.38, there's the truth table for it. And so what it has is, if E is zero, it doesn't matter whether A is zero or one, what is the state? Disconnected. And if E is 1 and A is 0, the output is 0. And if E is 1 and A is 1, the output is 1. So if you look at the right column of the truth table, how many states do we have? It could either be what? 0 or 1 or disconnected. Yeah. So the wire that's going through to X after... Yes. Um, it's, it's still connected to the bus wire. It's the electronics in here. Yeah. That the disconnected it happens inside here. So, but but if A is zero, then if A is zero, it, no if if E is zero, there's nothing. There's high impedance here. It's as if it's disconnected. It it's not. It's like it's not touching the bus wire. But if E is connected. If E is one, then if this is zero, it'll be zero. If it's one, it'll be but one. The wire between the gate. 
zero electrons going through it, right? When under what under what condition? Um, if a e is zero, e is one. Then that zero that zero is a signal. That that voltage that is a ground voltage which gets rep so that, that gets that gets detected as as a zero. So it's like sucking the electricity out of the wire. Oh no 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 the the, the signals are are not the it's not it's not current it's not based on current it's based based on voltage. Okay. I guess I just don't understand. Well, you need to have E and M. Yeah, you need the electricity. You need electricity and magnetism to see how that works, but. Roughly, the analogy is voltage is like pressure. Okay. And it's like it'd be high pressure or low pressure. Or disconnected means nothing. Well, that's a bad analogy when you deal with pressure. But <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Are you with me? So now look. Figure 11.39 shows, shows how to do this. What we do then is we put this... Um, this tri-state buffer in between gate 2 in subsystem A and the bus, and we put another tri-state buffer in between gate 4 and the bus in subsystem B. But in order for this to work, what do we always have to make sure? We always have, I mean, somewhere these two subsystems have to be coordinated, and we have to coordinate it in such a way that what happens? Either what? The E in A is what? On? At the same time, the what? E and B is in B is off, and similarly, that E in subsystem B is on when the E in subsystem A is off. We cannot have them on at the same time because if we have them on at the same time, then it's undefined what's on the bus. So that has to happen outside the control. We have to make sure that that happens outside. So does everybody see? And so now, with this setup, with this tri-state buffer, now we can have bi-directional buses. So now, with a bi-direct, okay, so, you know, when we had a unidirectional, if we have, if we have a unidirectional co connection, what does that look like? A unidirectional connection looks like this, right? But how do we, how will we do denote a bi-directional connection? We'll denote it like this. Are we good? Okay. So now, you guys, here comes how to build a whole memory. Now, um, what we're going to do is this, we're getting a little unrealistic on how we're going to do this memory subsystem. But the concept is, there's a lot of really realistic concepts in it. So what we are going to do is we are going to construct our memory just as if it were a bank of registers. Actually this is good for the memory of a cache. Some caches. Okay, so, so that's not, I take it back. We're not being all that unrealistic. Well. <laughs> okay, so let's take a look at how at how these memories subsystems are built. <clears throat> First of all, <clears throat> there's three control lines that go into each typical memory chip. They are chip select, write enable, and output enable. Because what we want to have happen is <clears throat> we, want to have, we want to be able to read to memory. In other words, have the data go from the bus into the memory. And we also want to have to, wait, what did I say? Read, so no write. Wait, read from memory. So we want to have, mem if, we, if we want to read from memory, we want to have the data go from memory to the bus. And if we want to write to memory, we want, we want to have data go from the bus to the memory system. Are you with me? <clears throat> so <clears throat> there's, these, there's typically these three signals that we have to control or that control the chip. CS is called chip select and CS is just like enabling or selecting the memory chip. Right? So that's like a, a select, that's like a, an enable a chip for the whole chip. Right? And we'll see the, inter, the inter, internal connection of how, how it works in a minute. And then WE, write enable, is the way, is what we 
assert what we send high in order to write or to store a memory word onto the chip. And then OE, output enable, that enables the output buffer to read a word from the chip. Okay? So does everybody understand? Memory reads is getting information from the chip. Memory writes is changing what's stored in the memory. Are we good? And now comes a really big, interesting thing <laughs> about organizing memory chips and about organizing memories in, memory in general. What do we know about each byte in memory in the PEP8, C, in the PEP8 computer? What did we always say that each byte of memory has? It's word addressable. It's not word addressable. We always said that it was what? Byte addressable. Each byte has, a, has an address. Are you with me? Each byte has an address. Now, what happens is this chip shown in figure 11.40a is a 64 by 8 bit memory chip. Now, why? Now, because it's, and what does that mean? That means there are 64 8 bit cells. Now, in order for this chip to store 64 bytes, how many address lines does it need? Six. Six. A0 through A5. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. Are you with me? So does everybody understand the address lines? Okay. So there's the address lines. And but are they bidirectional or unidirectional? Unidirectional. Unidirectional. On the other hand, the data is what? Bidirectional. Bi so we have D0, D1, D2, D3, D4, D5, D6, and D7. So that's up one byte. And then, and then down below, we have the controls. Chip select, write enable, and output enable. Is everybody clear on, on what that, how that works? OK, so, here's what, so what should we do? In order to write something to the chip, what do we have to do? We have to select it. Well, we have to put the data on the bus that we want to write. We have to put the address on the address lines of where we want to write it to. And then we have to select the chip and then and do right. a write enable. And that will put the data from here and in the byte at this address inside the chip. Is everybody with me? And if we want to read from that chip, what do we have to do? We have to ch select the chip. Put the address of what? Where we want to read it from. Are you with me? Assert the output enable. And then these data lines will contain the data in the byte at that address. Now, does everybody see how the chip works? Is that, are we good? OK. Because now what, this is abstraction. We're, we're going to go inside and see how it, OK. So now, and, but. <laughs> Now, tell me, how many bits are in this chip in figure 11.40A? 512. Hmm? 512. Yeah, 64 times 8. Is that what that is? Yes. 64 times 8? Yeah, that's right. It's 512 bits. Mm -hmm. All right. But they are organized. But how are they organized? Five bytes. As? Eight bits. Yeah, 8 bits as only 64 bytes. But there's another way to put 512 bits in a chip. We could have what? Every bit have an address. Every bit have an address and only have one. And there's, lo there's lots of stuff in between. What's another way to do it? Instead of having being 512 by 1 bit, it could be what? 256, 256 by 2. It could be what? 32 by 16. Yeah. Lots of possibilities. Yeah. Lots of possibilities. Are you with me? How many bits so do you have see? Eight? It's 64K of main oh, memory. 64,000. Well, it's tiny, actually, in these days. No, but it's a but lot. For, to put on a diagram, yeah. All right? So now we're going to take a look at how this memory is organized. So here's how we do memory access. To store a word, do a memory write. We select the chip by setting, setting CS to 1. We put data and addresses on the bus, and we set WE write enable to 1. To retrieve a word, 
memory read, we select the chip by setting, setting CS to 1, we put the address on the bus, we set output enable to 1, and we read the data on the bus. All right, so that's what we had said before. So that summarizes that. Okay, are you ready for this? You ready for the next slide? Drum roll. That's exactly what I thought I was going to do. <laughs> Figure 1141. Now, you guys, in order to keep the wires, uh, this is a super tiny example so that we don't have a bazillion wires in our figure. This is a super tiny chip that has how many cells of, what, of how big of a size? Can you tell from, from looking at that? How many, do you recognize any of those arrows? Let's go back to here. Let's go back to figure 1140. What arrows do we have coming in here? Address lines mm -hmm. and bidirectional data on one side and bidirectional data mm -hmm. and then what? CS, chip select, write, enable, and output enable, right? Mm -hmm. So what do we have? So how many address lines do we have coming in the figure 1141? Two. We have two. So how many? Four. So there's four cells. Mm -hmm. And how many data lines, bidirectional data lines, do we have coming out the bottom? Two. two. So there are how many? So 16. 16 bits. 16 bits, but how many is what by what? It's four by four. Yes, it's four by it, it is four no no. Four by two. Four by two. It's four four two bit cells. Can you go over that again? It's four in figure eleven forty one. It's definitely four by two. Figure 11.41, it's a 4 by 2 memory chip. How did you get that? Because there are four cells, each cell has two bits. Where are you getting the four cells from? Because there's two address lines and 2 to the 2 is 4. Let's go back here. In figure 11.40a, it's 64 by 8. That's literally how many bits are in the chip. 64 because you can address, you can access 64 cells with six address lines. Mm -hmm. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. You see, the address lines can be anywhere from 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. The next address is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. The next address is 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. All the way up to 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And so there are 64 of those combinations. So that's how many cells, that's how many 8-bit cells are in here. Are we good? Yeah? Okay. So this is a 4 by 2 memory chip. It would be the same, just, you know, wider and longer, you know, with the example over there. And let's see, and, and furthermore, look, what are they? Basically, you, what are these? Just a bunch, each one of these is what? D flip-flop. Flip so there's a, here's, a, here's the D flip-flop. At address zero. At address zero. Here's the D, the second one down is the row is the D flip-flop at address one, zero one. Address, the D flip-flop, the two-bit cell at address one, uh, one zero, and the two-bit cell at address one one. Now look, you guys. This really isn't all that hard to understand. Because look. What, what did we say, what did we say, hap how, how do you read, how did we say you would read data? How did we say you would do a read? First of all, you set chip select to what? One. To one. Now, let, let's, see, let's see what happens if chip select is zero. If chip select is zero, d d it, yeah, it disable, it, it goes into, it, it doesn't matter what write enable is. Okay, it's, it's, it's disabled, right? This MMV is a monostable multivibrator. We'll get to that in a minute. But, you know, it turns this off, it turns off the input of this. And not only that, it comes into these, to these little boxes down here, these little read-enable boxes. Okay, this is called, this is the read, there's a little exploded view of it, expanded. And this is what's inside each one of those boxes. Another enable one. Well, it's the tri-state device. See, so in figure 11.42, DW stands for what? Data, right. data write. That's when information is going from D up into data write. 
Are you with me? And then DR stands for what? Data read. data read. So that's when data is coming from the memory and through the tri-state device. But now what controls the tri-state device? What has to happen in order for the data read to be on the bus, onto the bus, go out through Chip D? Select. Chip select and what? Output enable. Does everybody see that? So if we come back here to figure 11.41, we see that the chip select and the output enable are, are those are the two inputs in here that go to that AND gate that go to the tri-state device. Does everybody see how that works? Okay, so let's go back here to our whole thing. So now let's think about how do you, what happens if you do a read? If you do a read, the chip select is one and the output enable is what? Is one. So what does that do inside this box according to figure 1142? It turns, it turns on the enable of the tri-state buffer and the DR the, is going all the way through and being presented on the bus. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So where is that? Where, sorry, that D read. Is that what I said? Mm -hmm. D read. Okay. So where is that D read coming from? According in figure, figure 11.42, it's coming from this what? OR gate. And how many inputs does this OR gate have? Four. It has four. Hmm, that's interesting. Where is that information coming from? Well, we are assuming that output enable is, is on and the chip select is on. So what happens is these two address lines are going into a what? Decoder. Decoder. Two by four decoder. What's the output of a two by four decoder? A one if oh. it is. One of them is one. Right. The others are zero. Right. So it's an enabler. So yeah. All right. And so, the one is, is for word zero, and then the second one is for word one, the third one is for word two, and the fourth one is for word three. Mm -hmm. And what are those lines doing? Enabling. They are enabling. Mm -hmm. They are. Enabling both the input and the output to the data, to the default box. Yes, they are. Yeah, the, th the, the line to look at is that. Yes, is that they. Yeah, let's ignore the input to the clock. Right, so they are going through. Yeah, they are going through these enable gates, right? Which goes back to, the which goes back to that four input or so one of these gates is is going to be is going to let the signal through, and the other one is all the other ones will be zero. So one of them goes through. Is that are you with me? All right. So and that's how that's how that's how re, uh, that's how to read, and so that signal is going through there, all in, all in parallel, 2-bit parallel. All right, if it were like 32 bits, it'd be 32 bits in parallel would be going through. All right? And now how would you do a write? Now how would you do a write? What, we have to, what do we have to do to do a write? Well, to do a write, we enable our chip select, and now what happens is, so we put our address on the address lines, so whatever, the address of whatever chip is, is going to be selected is going to be here. And now what happens is this. Now we do this. This monostable multivibrator is also called a one-shot device. When we turn on the right enable, what this little device does is it delays for a little bit and then it shoots out one clock pulse. What does mono stand for? One. one. So it sends out one clock pulse. Okay. Figure 11.43, well, sorry, figure 11.44 shows what happens. When the input goes up, this is the input to that MMV. When the input goes up, there, there's a delay that the engineers build into the device that we can control. And then it's one shot. Do you see what I mean? And that one shot device looks just like a what? It looks like a clock pulse. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? And if the right enable is high, you know, when it goes high, then a, a certain delay later then, after all the, all the gate delays for the addresses are all settled down, that clock pulse will, what will, what will that clock pulse be presented to? Each one of these AND gates, right? But that clock pulse will only get through what? The one, the the one that, where it has the address, right. at the right address. Right. 
And that's the one that will be sent to the what? To the D flip flops, the clock pulls of the D flip flops, which will store it. Are you with me? Now here's your exercise for Monday after spring break. It's to count how many gates are in all of these devices for a particular setup of a memory delay. of a mem of, no not not the gate delay to actually count how many yeah so you have to understand what's in each one of these so compounds you have to, you have to sort of know what's in the flop. yeah cool uh, so just to make sure that you to give you an exercise to make sure that you understand how the memory system works are we good Okay, great. See you next time. After, have a great spring break.